Their live press conference right here in the Chinese capital is set to begin with officials from a variety of sectors briefing the media on the improvement of livelihoods. Take a listen. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China, people are living a better life and are having a better sense of gain and happiness. We are very pleased today to have Minister of Education, Mr. Chen Baosheng, Minister of Civil Affairs, Mr. Huang Shuxian, Minister of Human Resources and Social Security, Mr. Zhang Jinan, Minister of Housing and Urban Rural Development, Mr. Wang Menghui, and the Minister of National Health Commission, Mr. Ma Xiaowei. Together, they will brief you about how China has worked to meet the needs of the people and deliver a better life to them. I first give the floor to Mr. Chen Baosheng, please. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I wish to start with a not very courteous sentence, but in a courteous manner, because the true words are sometimes tough. I want to say that I wish to say on behalf of all those who have worked in China's education system, to thank the friends from the media for your support and express our admiration over the seven decades since the founding of the People's Republic of China, with relentless hard work by generations of Chinese, China has achieved transformation in its education development. The path we have taken is exciting and produced important outcomes that are closely connected to every household and to the development of every individual. The achievements we've made can be categorized in the following points. One, the scale of development. So far, we have established the largest scale of education system in the world. I can give you three figures to illustrate that. One, we have more than 519,000 universities, colleges, and other kinds of schools. This is the major media of our education. The second number regards students. We now have more than 276 million students on campus. And number three, we have more than 16.7 million teachers in various institutions. These three numbers are often brought up and raised to the foreign friends that I have the chance to exchange views with. Most of them would have their eyes wide open because they are really marveled by the achievements we've made. And second, I'd like to refer you to the quality of our education. After 70 years of development, China is now among the medium and high level of the world. 
I also like to refer to four numbers, and all of them are related to 60 percent. Among all the senior professionals, 60 percent of them are in institutions of higher learning. Second, 60 percent of the research is done by institutions of higher learning. Number three, 60% of the key national laboratories are institutions of higher learning. 60% of the recipients of the three key national awards of science and technology are from institutions of higher learning. That is to illustrate the quality of our education. And the third area is to look at the structure of our education system. Now we have a complete education system with a full curriculum of different disciplines. It is fair to say that there is a reasonable structure in our education institutions. In the last 70 years, especially since the reform and opening up, we have seen more than 270 million graduates from universities and secondary vocational schools. Among our newly added labor force, 48.2% have received higher education, and the average length of education now stands at 13.6 years. This is a very important process of building up the human resource in China. The fourth area is that China's education has expanded in influence. We have opened up China's education to the world and tried to link up with international standards. Our universities are now the major entity for international educational exchanges. Be it basic education, vocational education, or higher education, China has been opening up wider to the world. The quality of our education is recognized by other countries. Our textbooks have showed up in the world stage and has won good results in international competitions. And China is now the largest source of overseas students for many countries, and the second largest destination of international students and the largest destination in Asia. In a word, our international influence has been growing we now is a member of the Washington Agreement on the Mutual Recognition of Engineering Degrees. The fifth area is that we have used the advantage of socialism. We, have, we are committed to the party's leadership over education and put in place a professionalism system that links from primary school to secondary school to universities. Since 2012, we have achieved the target of spending 4% of our budgetary input on education, and that has lasted for seven years in a row. In 2018, 
China has invested more than 460 million yuan in education. That means an average annual growth of 13.14%. Our investment in education is now the greatest among our budgetary spending. These efforts have greatly boosted the development of China's education. In a word, we have traversed a marveling journey in the last 70 years and achieved a real transformation. We are proud about what we have done. So much for my briefing. And I'd like to take your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen Baosheng. I now give the floor to Mr. Huang Shuxian. Ladies and gentlemen, friends from the media, good afternoon. I am pleased to brief you about the achievements we've made in civil affairs since the founding of the People's Republic of China. Civil affairs directly concerns the people. Over the 70 years, the departments of civil affairs at various levels have focused on the central work of the party and the country and played the role of a safety net in the society. We have effectively contributed to reform, development, and stability. After the founding of New China, the departments of civil affairs at various levels have worked to advance disaster relief in rural areas, provide living subsidies to the disabled, the elderly, and orphans in cities, offer shelter and education to the jobless and homeless, provide preferential treatment to family dependents of martyrs and military personnel, resettle veterans, and provide guidance to government at the primary level. We have worked to communicate the marriage law to the public, conduct a demographic census, mobilize militia, mobilize migrant workers, manage administrative division, administrative, administrate the registration of social organizations, and manage funerals and interment. Our work has played an important role in healing the trauma of war, maintaining social order, consolidating the new government, and advancing socialist reforms and development. Since the start of reform and opening up, particularly following the 18th CPC National Congress, China has made historic achievements in its civil affairs. First, social remedy has evolved from ad hoc measures to an institutional arrangement. A social relief system based on subsistence allowance is established. And is linked to poverty alleviation efforts. Supporting the basic life of about 60 million people in difficulties every year. Providing a robust safety net. Second, the scope of old age care services has been extended from the underprivileged to all senior citizens. A home-based system supported by communities 
and supplemented by agencies. Combining medical and caring services has taken shape. The system carries significant Chinese features. Currently, there are 173,300 old aged care agencies and facilities with 7.35 million beds, an allowance system that covers urban and rural residents in extreme poverty is established. Third, the coverage of child welfare has been extended from orphans to all children who are actually facing certain difficulties. We support more than 14 million children every year. And the two types of disability subsidies benefit 10.06 million disabled people and 11.93 million who are severely disabled. Fourthly, compulsory shelter for the homeless has been replaced by a framework of voluntary acceptance and free assistance. Supporting nearly 2 million people on average every year. Fifth, the system of community level self governance has been confirmed as a basic political system and is continuing to be improved. Comprehensive services facilities have covered 78.8% of cities and 45.7% of villages. The number of people specializing in community work has exceeded 1 million, and the number of registered volunteers exceeded 120 million. Six, the number of social organizations increased steadily. There are now 835,000 associations of various kind. Charity work, which used to be voluntary and scattered, are becoming law-based and institutionalized. In 2018, total donation exceeded 90 billion yuan. Seventh, the structure of administrative division continued to improve. The boundary surveys and the two rounds of geographical name surveys have been completed. Eighth, administration of marriage registration continued to improve. In recent years, around 14 million marriage registration applications were handled every year. Ninth, reforms on the administration of funerals and interment continued to deepen. Cremation rate reached 50.5%. A system of affordable interment services has been established. Tenth, the party's leadership over civil affairs has been strengthened. In 2018, the Ministry of Civil Affairs application to establish a department of old age care services, a department of child welfare, and a department of charity promotion and social work was approved as a step to reform the structure of governance, strengthening the functions of the civil affairs departments. We have tightened supervision of officials' conduct and fostered a culture that honors integrity. In the future, you will continue to be guided by the Xi Jinping thought on socialism with the Chinese characteristics for a new era and implement the instructions of President Xi Jinping 
as well as the decisions of the CPC Central Committee. We will continue to foster a culture of integrity and work hard to meet the basic needs of the people and contribute to the completion of the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huang Shuxian. I now give the floor to Mr. Zhang Jinan. Friends from the press, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you for your long-time care and support for our work related to human resources and social security. Employment is of paramount importance to people's lives, while social security is a safety net to the people. China has always attached great importance to social security and employment, particularly since the 18th Party Congress, the CPC Central Committee, with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core, has put employment high on the agenda of economic and social development taken the development of the social security system as an important means to achieve common prosperity, adopted a series of important policy decisions and made remarkable achievements. On employment, we have maintained a long-time stable employment and achieved relatively full employment. First, more jobs have been created. The number of people in work increased from 180 million in 1949 to 780 million in 2018, with an expansion of 3.3 times, while the total population expanded 1.6 times. To be more specific, urban jobs expanded 27.3 times. In recent years, the number of new urban jobs created every year has been over 13 million for six years running. In another word, the number of new jobs every year is close to the number of total jobs in 1949, which is around 15 million. Second, employment structure has been improved. The employment structure in urban and rural areas have achieved historic transformation. The share of urban jobs increased from 8.5% in 1949 to 56% in 2018. Jobs in the tertiary sector increased from 9.1% in 1952 to 46.3% in 2018. The channels and forms of employment have been diversified. Third, the quality of employment have been upgraded steadily. Vocational skills have been improved and the rank of technicians has been expanded. Income has been growing and the rights and interests of workers have been effectively protected. The proactive employment policy with Chinese characteristics has been substantiated. We have basically put in place a public employment service system and the human resources market has been growing. On social security, we have basically set up a social security system covering urban and rural residents and the social security network has been strengthened. First, more and more people have been covered by social security. In 1951, the number of workers entitled to labor insurance was 2.69 million. Now basic aged care insurance covers over 950 million people. Both unemployment and work injury insurance cover over 200 million people and most of the job categories. Second, social security capacity has been enhanced. The funds are expanding. Aged care, unemployment, and work injury 
funds run a cumulative surplus of 6.8 trillion. Third, Social Security has been more effective. The amount of pension has been increasing. Unemployment benefit and work injury compensation has been growing. The service has been more convenient. And now, nearly 1.3 billion people have social security cards. In just a few decades, China has basically set up the world's largest social security safety net. In 2016, China received the award for outstanding achievement in social security from the International Social Security Association, which also represents what we have accomplished. Moving forward, guided by the Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era, we will continue to adopt a people-centered approach, explore new grounds promote higher quality and fuller employment, build a fairer and more sustainable social security system in all respects, so that the reform and development can better benefit all of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang Jinan. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Wang Menghui. Ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China seven decades ago, particularly since the party's 18th National Congress, under the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core, we have made remarkable achievements in our work related to housing and urban rural development and made great contribution to our economic social development and to the improvement of people's lives. First, people's housing conditions have been substantially improved. In the past seven decades, the party and the government has always attached great importance to housing. With hard work, we have basically addressed the housing needs of urban and rural residents in a large country with 1.4 billion people. Per capita living space in urban areas grew from 8.3 square meters in 1949 to 39 in 2018, and the number in rural areas increased to 47.3. Institutional reform has been improved, and more government-subsidized housing, ha housing units have been built. We have built over 80 million such housing units, helping over 200 million people. And we have set up the world's largest housing security system. Second, our cities have experienced daily changes. The process of urbanization has created many miracles in the world's history of city development. The number of cities increased from 132 in 1949 to 672 in 2018. Urbanization rate increased from 10.6% to 59.6 percent. Since the start of the reform and opening up, infrastructure development in cities has picked up pace. Road lands grew by 15 times. Urban reforestation space grew by 19 times. The capacities for sewage and waste treatment increased by 263 and 395 times. And the ratio of access to gas and running water reached 96.7 and 98.4 percent. The hosting capacity of cities have been strengthened, and the living environment has become better. Third, the countryside has taken on a new look. The process of building a new socialist countryside has been advanced bringing great changes to the rural areas. Since the party's 18th National Congress, to alleviate poverty, we have renovated dilapidated rural homes, benefiting 17.94 million households, including over 7 million registered poor households in rural areas.
We've stepped up efforts to make our countryside more beautiful and livable, improved planning, construction and management, so our villages are different from before. We've delivered better sewage and waste treatment. We have protected traditional villages. And listed many traditional villages as protected targets. Of course, the construction industry has enjoyed good development. People working in this industry took up over 7% of our total workforce, and it has played a more important role in national economy and made great contributions to rural and urban development, improved people's lives. Engineering techniques have been improved. The Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, the new airport in Beijing, and other major projects are among the best in the world in engineering. The construction industry is going abroad at a faster pace and played important roles in Belt and Road Corporation. We are proud of what we have achieved and we are confident about the future. Starting at, standing at a new historical starting point, we will be guided by the Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics and a people-centered approach, pursue new development, continue to improve people's lives and make more progress in housing and rural urban development related work to make our contribution to build a moderately prosperous society in our respects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Ma Xiaowei. Thank you, friends from the press, for your long-term care and support for China's health. A healthy population is a key mark of a prosperous nation and a strong country. Seventy years since the founding of the new China, the party and the country have attached great importance to public health. We've always put people at the center to establish a basic health care system. In particular, since the 18th Party Congress, under the strong leadership of the Party Central Committee with President Xi Jinping at its core, we have given priority to health and has put forth the Healthy China Initiative. This ushered in a new journey for building a healthy China. The past 70 years saw continued improvement in public health. Life expectancy has increased to 77 years, up from 35 years. Infant mortality has dropped to 6.1 per thousand, down from 200 per thousand, and maternal mortality rate was down from 1,500 per 100,000 to 18.3. Main health indicators in China beats the average of middle and high-income countries. With relatively less input, China has provided access to medical resources to all its people, accounting for one-sixth of the global total. It is fair to say that we have found a distinctively Chinese path for providing health services. After 70 years of relentless efforts, China's health services have undergone massive changes, demonstrated in the following areas. First, health and medical services continue to improve and are now much more accessible to the people. A three-tiered service network covering urban rural areas, including provinces, have been established. Now everyone can have access to medical care. It has become a dream come true. The development of private hospitals is also speeding up. China has over 990,000 health institutions and 8.4 million hospital beds, so the rate is over 20 percent. And now the total number of house workers reached 12.31 million, meaning that the number of doctors and nurses per 1,000 people is now 2.59 and 2.94. It is higher than the average of middle-income countries.
Second, spending in the health sector has continued to increase and the burden of accessing health services has been eased. China's health spending takes up 6.6% of the GDP. Government subsidies for basic medical insurance for rural and urban residents have increased significantly. For basic public health services, expenditures per capita has also increased. So we've developed such a system from scratch over the past 12 years. To make it more sustained, it now covers um, over 1.3 billion people, and the coverage ratio is stabilized at above 95 percent. So with relatively less time, we have established a nationwide medical insurance scheme. Individual expenditure has dropped to 28 um, percent of um, total expenditure, the lowest since the 21st century. Third, with an emphasis on prevention, major diseases have been effectively put under control. We have carried out extensive patriotic health campaigns, which significantly improved the health improve environment. Now, the rate of infectious disease has dropped significantly. Currently, um, AIDS, tuberculosis, schizomyosis has been eliminated or been kept under check. We've also made good progress in um, controlling communicable diseases. China is also home to a capable response team dealing with a number of um, major outbreaks such as SARS and H7N9. Force. Medical services have continued to improve to give our people a stronger sense of gain. In key technologies and skills, we've made breakthroughs and produced world-class results. New technologies, equipment and methods are being widely applied. In expanding supply, improving quality, and improving the working ethics of doctors, we've also made remarkable progress. Now, um, in and out patients totaled 8.3 billion, and the number of discharged patients exceeds 250 million. We continue to facilitate poverty reduction by creating more access to health services and work to ensure health services are accessible to women, children, the elderly, people with disabilities, and poor population, and continue to make services more equitable. Fifth, we have leveraged the unique advantages of traditional Chinese medicine and supported its preservation and innovation. We've continued to make TCM more available overseas. Six, we have expanded international cooperation and taken part in global health governance. So far, China has, has dispatched in total 26,000 medical personnel to 71 countries who have made 280 million diagnoses. We have also strengthened cooperation with other countries and supported Western African countries in combating Ebola. China has also signed and implemented over 160 cooperation agreements signed with relevant countries and regions. Going forward, we will continue to implement the Healthy China Initiative to ensure high quality development of healthcare services so as to serve the um, interest of our people. Thank you, Mr. Ma. People's livelihood has covered a wide range of areas and witnessed a sea change over the past 70 years. We've indeed made remarkable progress. Now let's move into the Q&A session and please identify yourself first. From CCTV, my question is for Minister Ma. You mentioned the progress we've made over the past 70 years in house. We do feel that um, the house environment has been greatly improved. Well, what measures will we take mass next to address the issue of inaccessible and expensive medical care? Thank you for your question. Well, the issue of inaccessible and expensive medical care will continue to be a key part of our work. Overall, the principle 
multiple contradictions in China's health care services is people's diverse and multi-leveled needs for medical resources and a shortage of resources and uneven distribution and the lack of quality resources in China. In particular, the distribution of resources are uneven between different regions, between urban and rural areas, and between different types of hospitals. So to deepen reforms means that we need to work on resource allocation to solve this issue. So there are four fronts that we are now working on. First is to steadily advance the building of regional medical centers. We need to upgrade the um, medical services in at provincial levels so that each province is capable of solving complex and serious illnesses within the province so that patients will not all rush into large cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou to get treated. Recently, the central office adopted an opinion on building regional centers. We have signed agreements with four provinces to start our relevant work. This will help us to channel more patients away from large cities and into other provinces. So this is to um, straight up relations between different regions. Second, we will continue to work on improving the capability of provincial, lo provincial level hospitals. We've introduced a program that helps to train hundreds of millions of high caliber doctors. We found that the development of health care in rural areas, especially in provinces, are crucial. If at county level, complex and serious illnesses can be treated, then rural population will not have to go to large cities to get treated. However, now if they have to go to large cities, then there will be disease-induced poverty. So solving inaccessible and expensive health care means that we need to treat the lion's share of diseases at county level. So county level must have multi-disciplines and be fit for treating relevant diseases so that they won't need to go to large cities for small ailments and complex diseases. Currently, 500 county level hospitals has reached the level of tertiary hospitals and our goal is by 2020 to upgrade another 500 county level hospitals and Chinese medicine hospitals to the level of tertiary ones. Third, we are now integrating regional medical resources. The issue we have now is that people all flock into big city hospitals to getting a diagnosis. It is very crowded in big cities for hospitals, but in rural areas, nobody visits local hospitals. Actually, there are plenty of hospitals, but they all, for example, would go to Xiehe Hospital for treatment. So, if we cannot improve the level of um, regional and local hospitals, people would, of course, choose large cities. So we are introducing medical consortiums in cities and establishing an integrated network of um, medical communities at, uh, at the county level so that we can better distribute our medical resources for it to reach um, rural population. So this will help us to ensure that um, serious diseases can be treated in big city hospitals and while small ailments can be treated at um, rural level hospitals. This is also um, the practice in other countries. This means that different types of hospitals treat different types of diseases and have their own areas of responsibilities. Force. We're also working on um, changing payment methods for medical insurance. Where people go is closely linked with uh, payment methods. The fees paid 
in large and small hospitals are different. So their role as levers, of course, are different. So we are now working on payment reforms so that acute diseases will be treated at hospitals for these diseases at a certain fee. But for other types of diseases, there will be um, other appropriate fees. For example, at lower level hospitals, the reimbursement rate will be higher, but for um, higher level hospitals, it will be lower. This will also guide patients to go to appropriate hospitals. We are also um, encouraging tertiary hospitals to carry out daycare services. Many patients need surgeries, and um, they now provide surgeries without uh, leaving a wound on patients. So with this work, by fully using resources on our hands, we are working on a tiered diagnosis for better results. This is um, working on what we have. And another issue on the quality of medical resources. Now we are carrying out professional training for hospital residents. Doctors have to train for five years before they can go into a hospital. But when they are at a hospital, they will start as interns, not residents. This is why we have now increased a program of three years for them to get training in big hospitals first. This means that going forward, different types of hospitals will all have almost the same level of doctors with similar um, quality of uh, doctors, patients will be, to, will be able to have more hospitals to choose from. So more even resources will help us to more evenly distribute patients. This is why we're working on the fundamentals, the training of doctors and nurses to solve this issue. There are also three fronts we're working on to make medical care more affordable. First, we are increasing um, the medical insurance benefits. Currently, our medical insurance has a large coverage, but for serious diseases, for diseases that would have huge financial costs, the coverage is still not enough. We can only help, for example, 70 percent of um, patients with serious illness. So, to have coordinated medical insurance at city level is not enough. We need to bring that up to the provincial level for us to bring down the costs of medical care. This will help us to raise more funds. Thirdly, um, secondly, the development of uh, private sector medical insurance. Um, currently, development in this area is um, lacking behind. With private sector, it is impossible to solve all the issue of medical insur insurance. So we need to bring in private actors. Even in developed countries, private sector can only account for 70 percent of medical insurance, and the left is being covered by the private sector. Secondly, where we need to improve drug policies. I believe recently we're working on the bidding of um, pharmaceuticals. We need to bring down overpriced drugs. The State Council um, has taken resolute measures to solve this issue. Actually, this is one of their key priority in recent years. First is to bring down the costs of imported patented drugs and also include some of them into our medical um, care and also to increase the bidding of um, generic drugs. We have brought down prices of 25 types of drugs to uh, bring down by 52 percent. In particular, we need to remove intermediary agencies in drug prices, overpriced drugs, um, to solve the issue of overpriced drugs bear on the entire industry. If this issue can be properly settled, it will greatly contribute to healthy competition in China's medical services. It will also help us to better regulate and manage hospitals and doctors. So overpriced, drug, overpriced drugs is the key priority of our work. Solving this issue 
would be achieving something we want to do for years. Also, we would need to encourage public hospitals to use more basic drugs to ensure better distribution. Now, on distribution and usage, so far, our people have benefited from a marked down drug prices. And thirdly, we need to work on public hospitals. The State Council recently introduced performance assessments for public hospitals. We will focus more on quality rather than quantity, focus on more refined management instead of extensive management. We should focus more on um, upgrading um, benefit entitlements for healthcare workers instead of expand, expanding the size of hospitals. We need to put idle funds into use. So we need to. This is all from me. Thank you. This China Daily. Skilled workers are an important component to drive economic growth. At the just concluded World Skills Competition, Chinese competitors have got very good results. My question is, in the next step, how are you going to promote the development of professional skilled workers? Thank you for your interest in the development of technicians. The World Skills Competition is also known as the Olympics of Skills. China first took part in 2011. At that time, we won a silver medal. This time, we won 16 gold medals, 14 silver, and 5 bronze. We ranked the first in terms of the number of gold medals, the number of medals, and the total score. This is our best performance, and this result also shows the growing number of competence of our technicians and the growing scale and level of our industrial development. Recently, General Secretary Xi Jinping gave special instructions. He fully recognized the impressive performance of our team members and raised higher requirements for us, which will be the basic principle for us to follow. The development of technicians is a major undertaking that delivers real benefits to the country, to businesses, and to the people. For the country, this is an important pillar for Made in China and created by China for businesses, it will help them to increase their competence and revenue. For individuals, working skills will benefit for their whole career and help them to achieve high-quality employment. Among the team members that won prize, four of them are from registered poor households. So the acquiring of technical skills can help a family to get out of poverty. So moving forward, our general consideration to advance the development of technicians is to focus on one goal, stick to three orientations, and step up efforts in four aspects. Focus on one goal. That is the goal to move faster, to expand the rank of high-quality workers and technicians, which is put forth by General Secretary Xi Jinping. This means that we need to move faster, increase the number, and improve the competence. Stick to three orientations means being capacity-oriented, that is, to improve the skills and competence of workers. Being market-oriented means that we need to base our efforts on the demands of the society, of the industry, of businesses, and of individuals. Being problem-oriented means that we need to focus on weak links, 
focus on these problems, find their root causes, and resolve them. Step up efforts in four aspects. First, step up vocational training. As you may know, we are implementing a vocational skill training initiative on a large scale. Within three years' time, we will use 100 billion yuan surplus of unemployment insurance fund to provide training to 50 million people, which can also be called the 315 project, in short. This project includes many targeted and effective supporting initiatives which can benefit the businesses and the people. For the businesses, it will bring more opportunities, and for individuals, they will have better opportunities in their career. And uh, we hope that uh, all of those who are interested can seize the opportunities. Second, step up institutional reform. Particularly, we need to improve the mechanisms related to the training, use, appraisal, and stimulation. We need to set up a lifetime training scheme that covers rural and urban workers, roll out a new type of apprentice system in companies, reduce uh, certificates and accreditation, accreditations, and do away with unreasonable restrictions for the better use of technicians, and we will give them more rewards to help them to develop. All in all, there are things we need to do away with, and there are things we need to set up. We will need take comprehensive approaches. Third, step up the organization of competitions. Vocational skill competitions, particularly for the young people, are an important means for their development. We will make sure that competitions will facilitate education, training, evaluation, and rewarding. We will set up a competition system that is multi-tiered, namely world-class competitions, state-class competitions, and on-the-job contests. And we will conduct state-level skills competitions to provide more platforms and opportunities for the development of technicians. We will also ensure the success of the 46th World Skills Competition to be held in Shanghai to make it a, an innovative one with influence. Fourth, step up outreaching. With the attention paid by the party and the government, the environment is improving. But there are still people who believe that education is more important than capability, equipment is more important than skills, and theory is more important than practice, which needs to be addressed. That is why on this occasion, I would like to ask you for this favor in our outreaching efforts to help us better interpret and present relevant policies and spread the stories of successful technicians as well as the stories of state-renowned uh, craftsmen so that the whole society will care about this work. That's what I would like to say. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. From Phoenix, uh, senior citizens are in every family, so aged care is concerned with all of us. My question is that in the past four decades, what has been achieved in ensuring aged care service and what more will be done? Thank you. Let me take your question. Uh, you made a very good point that there are senior citizens in every family and everyone 
will get old. And let me add that everyone cares about this issue. Senior people care about it. The middle-aged people care about it. Not only because they will become old too, but also because they will incur the burden of uh, raising the senior citizens. The children also want to see that their grandparents live a good life. So everybody cares about this. The State Council, the CPC Central Committee and the State Council have placed old age care high on their agenda. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China, especially after the 18th Party Congress, we have achieved historical transformation in the provision of old age care services. This is reflected in the following aspects. First, an old age care system with Chinese features is taking shape. We have established a home-based system supported by communities and complemented by various kinds of agencies that combines medical and caring services. This is also a multi-tiered system. In recent years, to meet the need for home-based services, we have expanded pilot reforms of home-based and community-based old age care to meet the people's diverse needs. We have opened up the old age service market and, in, and increased the participation of the market and non-government sectors. By the end of June 2019, there are 29.9 thousand old age caring agencies 143.4 thousand community old age care agencies and facilities, with a total of 7.35 million beds. Among them, more than 50 percent of the agencies and nearly 40 percent of the beds are supplied by non-government players. In this way, the government is no longer the premier and sole major player. Instead, it is working with other actors to provide old age services. Second, an old age service system with Chinese features is basically established. China has promulgated a law on the protection of rights and interests for senior citizens, and for many years we have included old age services into the outline of the National Economic and Social Development Plan, as well as the list of basic national public services. At the central level, we have uh, for, uh, released documents on speeding up the development of old age services, opening up the old age services market, and promoting the combination of medical and caring services. This year, to address the major bottlenecks in this sector, the State Council has also released measures to expand supply and promote consumption, with a focus on breaking the institutional impediments to the development of old age care services. In addition, we have included 15 million eligible people into the scope of subsistence allowance and 4 million people into the government budgetary support. Now, the old age services allowances and caring allowances have basically covered all provinces. 
benefiting close to 36 million senior citizens. We're also establishing a system to care about the senior citizens left behind by migrant worker families, in providing better services uh, in medical, uh, transport, education, and recreation. Third, we have continued to improve the quality of old age services. We are working to implement the important instructions by General Secretary Xi Jinping to improve the quality of old age nurseries and continued to increase input in facilities of old age nurseries. We have taken comprehensive measures to address the risks and potential hazards in nursery centers to deliver a safe and comfortable life for senior citizens living in nursery institutions. We have adopted national and industrial standards such as the basic regulation on old age care agencies and the grading regulation on nursery centers to ensure good quality in old age service providers. We are also developing an industry for the equipment used by disabled senior citizens and strengthen the training of personnel dedicated to old age care. Old age care concerns everyone and every family and is a long-term task. In the future, we will work with relevant agencies to improve our policy, mainly to open up the market and develop the sector, improve the services system, which, as I said, is a home-based system supported by communities where the senior citizens will be living in, supplemented by relevant agencies and nursery centers. This is especially true for some senior citizens in extreme poverty and lost their children. Some of them would rather choose to stay in the three centers, so we need to make sure that these centers are of good quality and that is combine, combining medical and caring services, which is also a very important aspect. We are working expeditiously to strengthen the links between medical services and caring services. So, all in all, this is our step to improve the services system. We will also expand services supply. We must make vigorous effort to increase the diverse supply of old age services. And most importantly, we will enhance the quality of services, ensure safety and comfort. We are confident that through the joint efforts of all relevant parties, we will deliver a happy and healthy life to our senior citizens. Thank you. Southern Metropolis Daily. My question is for Mr. Chen Baosheng. Education is of great interest to uh, the society. My question is, uh, which are the main features of China's education? Thank you. You asked about the features of Chinese education. 
And in essence, we are talking about the patterns of a certain subject. In a word, we have achieved remarkable results in the last 70 years and realized the historic transformation. If I try to summarize the journey we have traversed in the last 70 years, I would say we have grown fast and focused on equity. So the key word is leapfrog, fast progress. We have achieved that through real hard efforts. Why did I say that the key word is leapfrog progress? I rem let me remind all of us that at the beginning of the People's Republic of China, only 20% of children are in schools. And there are only 110,000 university students. After 70 years of development, we are roughly at a much higher level. So in about 20 years' time, we have completed a journey that took developed countries for a century, which is to deliver popularization of compulsory education. And in just a dozen years' time, we have extended the coverage of higher education from the elites to the general public. And this year, we will aim to popularize higher education. Remember, we only had 110,000 university students at the beginning of the People's Republic of China, so we can see what a journey we have traversed. Now, for preschooling children, 81.7% are now in a campus. For primary school students, 99.5% are enrolled in compulsory education schools, 80, more than 80% I enrolled in secondary high schools. This year, we are ex increasing one million students to be enrolled in universities. And that's a key step to take us into a stage of popularizing higher education. Such is the speed of China's education development. And the second key word is equity. Equity is a key objective for the development of socialism and also a principal value for us in the education system. And the key word of equity is balance. And sometimes we need to tip the balance. There are differences between different regions, different schools, different communities. To fill the gap and find the balance, we need to tip it. In recent years, under the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee with General Xi Jinping at its core, we have made greater efforts to do that. First, we have leaned more towards the rural areas. Rural areas have now caught up with urban areas in terms of school construction, teacher staffing, public spending per student, and the standard of basic facilities. Currently, 99.8% of compulsory education schools, both in urban and rural areas, have reached the basic requirements of setting up a school.
this is a great improvement. When you go to the rural areas, we often say the most beautiful facilities are in schools. Uh, secondly, we lean more towards the communities, uh, underprivileged communities. We have established a financial support system that covers students in all stages, from preschool to graduate school. So far, between 2007 and 2018, we have supported 970 million students in different stages. This is world-class scale. Thirdly, we lean toward the poor regions. I, need, I want to add one point in the previous uh, area. We also provide special support for students with impaired sight or hearing or those who are intellectually challenged. Among these three categories, gross enrollment rate in the stage of compulsory education has reached more than 90%. This is also an important mark of an advanced culture. In addition, we are leaning towards ethnic minorities. We have organized many ethnic classes for students from Tibet, Xinjiang, and other regions of ethnic minorities. These are special education programs that have been in place for many years. The total number of enrollment has reached 822,000. This has greatly enhanced education for ethnic minority regions. We have also set up special enrollment programs for poor areas and rural areas, enrolling 478,400 students. These programs are widely supported and welcomed by the people. In the simplest terms, our development has been fast and equitable. So the key words are leapfrog progress and balance. China will continue down this path to speed up its modernization of education and deliver quality education to the satisfaction of the people. We are now a major country of education but we now need to move to become a strong country in education. Maybe we cannot work to the satisfaction of everybody, but we must bear in mind the satisfaction of the people and focus on delivering benefits to every member of the society, every student who will change their life through education and create a bright future for themselves. I believe our development will be even faster and focus more on quality. Thank you. Macau Asia TV. To Minister Wang, can you brief us, uh, elaborate on the progress we have made on housing security and future plans? Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for your care for and interest in our work related to housing. In the past seven decades, we have improved the institutions of housing, strengthened capacity, and we have set up the world's largest housing security system. As you may know, after the founding of the People's Republic and before the reform and the opening up, what we had was an accommodation allotment system where the supply cannot meet the demand with a serious shortage. When the reform and opening up started, the per capita living space was only 6.7 square meters smaller than before the founding of the People's Republic of China. So we have explored the reform of the institutions. In 1994, the State Council decided to deepen the reform of the housing system. We have also stepped up the pace of the construction of government subsidized houses to help mid and low income families in cities in 2007. Over 10 million lower rent housing units and affordable housing units were built since 2008. We began to roll out the projects to build more government subsidized houses. By 2018, we have built over 70 million government subsidized housing units. About 22 million people received public renting uh, subsidies, which helped to address the housing needs of about 200 million people. Particularly since the 18th Party Congress, the number of government subsidized houses and relocation houses built was over 40 million. We have benefited over 100 million people with housing needs. And uh, we have basically covered the households on subsistence allowance and low-income families in cities and helped to relieve the burden on new citizens. We have greatly improved the living conditions of mid- and low-income families. As a result, the sense of gain, happiness, and security of our people has been strengthened. Moving forward, we will continue to improve the housing security system and housing market system move faster to address the housing needs of low-income urban families and new citizens so that all of our people can have a place they call home. We will focus mainly on the four aspects. First, build more public rent houses. We will improve the mechanisms related to the application, waiting in line, entrance and exit of public renting houses and uh, implement the government procurement of maintenance and management to deliver better services. Second, grow the rental market. We will review and apply the experience in 12 pilot cities, implement supporting policies, increase the effective supply of renting houses, particularly focus on the housing needs of new citizens. Third, Encourage houses with shared property rights based on specific conditions. We will review the experience of Beijing and Shanghai. Encourage cities with large migration inflow and high property price to develop houses with shared property rights based on their realities. Force steadily advance. Uh, the renovation of run urban rundown areas. We will both do our best while avoid overstretching ourselves. We will focus on uh, old rundown areas and the rundown areas in state owned mining, forestry, and farming zones. Build more supporting infrastructure, carry out strict quality and safety supervision, accelerate the construction and allotment so that people can live in their new houses as early as possible. It's been about 90 minutes. Last question, please. I uh, saw some foreign journalists. I wonder if you have any questions. No, uh, 
from Lianhe Zaobao. A question about employment. China's economy is faced with downward, growing downward pressure. In his interview with a Russian news agency, Mia Li Keqiang said that it is not easy to maintain a growth of or above 6%. So my question is that how has the downward pressure on the economy affected employment and what will be done? Thank you for your question on employment. Employment is a, country, is a problem faced by many countries, and this problem in China has attracted more attention because we have a population of nearly 1.4 billion. Employment depends not only on economic growth, but also economic structure. As for China, we have a large workforce. We also have a large economy and market. Particularly, our tertiary sector has been developing rapidly, which has created more jobs. Business startups and innovations have been booming. New business forms and models have been developing quickly which has provided a good foundation for stable employment, particularly our systematic and institutional advantage is that we can succeed in many major undertakings under the leadership of the party. This year, the central government has prioritized stable employment in ensuring stabilities in six areas. All sectors of the society have worked together, and generally speaking, we've maintained a generally stable employment, which is not easy. First, the major indicators of employment are running within the proper range. In the first eight months, 9.84 million new urban jobs were created, accomplishing 89% of this year's target. In August, the surveyed urban unemployment rate was 5.2%, lower than the control target of 5.5%. Second, Supply and demand are basically balanced. In the second quarter, the job opening to job seeker ratio was 1.22. So the supply and demand are basically balanced. Third, the employment of college graduates, rural migrant workers are generally stable. Mr. Chen talked about our educational development. We have 8.34 million college graduates this year, which is a record high number. And the employment of these college graduates is generally in tandem with last year. In some time to come, with small factors of influence, we are faced with many challenges in employment. But we have the confidence to ensure employment. Uh, we will highlight one priority and have five focuses. To highlight one priority means that we will give more priority to employment, and employment will be a prioritized target in economic development and stable and expanding employment will be the bottom line of range regulation. We will create a virtuous interaction between economic growth and employment expansion. The five focuses include first focus on relieving the burdens on enterprises. Stable employment can come from only stable companies and stable job openings. We will reduce enterprises' contributions to social insurance. It is expected that the reduction will be over 300 billion yuan. And 
we will increase the rewarding for the companies with no layoffs or less layoffs. And for those who hire people with difficulties, we will provide them with social insurance subsidy, uh, interest subsidy, and tax reduction and exemptions. Second, focus on business startups to stimulate employment. We will better implement the policies for to encourage business startups with tax reductions. Third, we will focus on vocational skill training, which is key to resolving the structural issues in our employment. Uh, there are both cases where you cannot find the right worker and you cannot find the job. We talked about the 315 project, with, which is directly related. Fourth, focus on improving employment services. From the beginning of this year, we have started an initiative targeted at rural migrant workers. Now we are carrying out another initiative targeted at college graduates. We have hosted over 40,000 job fairs and provided services to over 50 million people, and we will do more. Fifth, focus on ensuring the basic living needs. We will continue the one-on-one -on -one supporting mechanism, zero out jobless families, ensure the unemployment insurance are paid on time to ensure their basic living needs. We will go all out to take concrete actions to ensure employment. Thank you. I wonder. Thank you so much for your patience. There was a live press conference here in the Chinese capital, briefing the media on the major achievements the country has made on people's livelihoods in the 70 years since the establishment of the PRC. Now let's go live to our reporter Liu Yang, who is standing by at the press briefing. Liu Yang, for the viewers that are just joining us and may have missed the key information mm -hmm. there at the press briefing, what are the key takeaways? Mm -hmm. Hello, Zhong Shi. The press conference is giving the world a full picture of historical changes in China over these past seven decades and how challenging it all was. Most importantly, how these profound changes have affected billions of Chinese people, many generations. So at the briefing, government officials covered a wide range of topics from civil affairs to social security, uh, education, health care, housing conditions. They mentioned some staggering figures. Uh, for example, in education, 70 years ago, 80% of Chinese people were illiterate, and only some 100,000 people enrolled in college. Now there are about 40 million students are receiving college education around China. So, uh, and uh, in order to solve the education equality, for example, for students in poor families in rural areas, uh, fees, including magazines and a tax books are exempt and they also uh, receive allowances for living expenses. Uh, if students are dropped off from school, local authorities uh, will be taken accountable and an, another option is demoted. And in the health sector, I want to say that experts say China's most praiseworthy strides lie within its medical and health achievements. Uh, for example, medical institutions have grown from less than 10,000 in 1949 to now nearly 1 million nationwide. Uh, take the health conditions uh, in Tibet Autonomous Region as an example. Uh, the average life expectancy in the region has increased from 35 years old to 68 years old. Undoubtedly, that is related to all sorts of uh, living conditions and the happiness of the people actually uh, increased in the past 70 years. And also, there are many things I want to say that keep in mind China is still a developing country and there are many things many issues uh, on the government agenda needs to be resolved, needs to be uh, improved uh, in the future. Uh, for example, improving uh, nursing uh, homes, uh, both in urban and rural areas, and also, uh, you know, improving uh, you know, the medical center, medical quality services in rural areas, uh, as well as increasing, you know, nursing homes quality. Get back to you.
Our Liu Yang there with a summary for us at the press conference. Liu, thanks so much. And joining me here in the studio to discuss more is Jiang Gong from the University of International Business and Economics. Professor Gong, thanks so much for staying with us. Thank well, just like the moderator at the press briefing there said, this is such a big topic, mm -hmm. people's livelihoods. This is a comprehensive mm -hmm. um, topic involving multiple sectors. We had five ministers today at the press conference there in Beijing, each outlining what has happened, what has been achieved in their respective uh, sector. And I saw you scribbling down so many numbers <laughs> and data. Talk to us about what kind of achievements stood out for you and could be understood um, for the sake of our international viewers. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tonsu. Yeah, I took a fair amount of notes. Uh, a lot of numbers being thrown out from these five ministers. And I think I'll just go through you know, each one of their uh, uh, briefing and uh, you know, highlight the, some of the things that impressed me most. I will start with the Minister of Education. Education. Uh, that's an area that I'm quite familiar with. Uh, I think uh, in, in, in one of the questions and answer sessions, uh, he, he mentioned uh, the, the, the features, the characteristics, unique characteristics of advertising uh, Chinese education development. He said two words. One is speed. Second thing is uh, equity. In other words, we're, uh, we're growing very fast and also uh, we're, uh, we're growing at the same time taking care of the equity issue. I think that's a, a, a very interesting uh, statement. Also, I think what impresses me most is that he put a label on the level of higher education development mm. in China. He called it medium to high level, medium to high level. And I think um, I think it's a quite fair assessment. I think uh, you know, in my mind, we're still having some distance with the first tier universities around the world, with uh, say you know Harvard University and MIT. We still have some 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 distance uh, away from that. The Chinese <coughs> universities keep up climbing on the world universities rank our, our every year. Absolutely, our first tier universities like you know Beijing University. Tsinghua University, to some extent, uh, my own university, UIB, in economics and business education area, we are catching up rapidly with the first tier universities in the world. I think uh, um, Beijing University and Tsinghua University probably uh, have already broken into the top, I would say, 30 best universities in the world. 30, I would say 30, okay. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, if that's what the uh, Minister of Education is mean by uh, medium to high level, I think that's where, that's exactly where they are, okay. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, so let's go through the list very quickly. Uh, from Minister of Civil uh, Affairs, I think uh, he, he mentioned a couple of uh, interesting uh, statistics. Uh, he talked about, uh, you know, one very important thing about, you know, uh, elderly care mm -hmm. is now extending not just to the people who are uh, 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 unprivileged, but m to the older citizens. Okay. Yeah, and 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 uh, you know, talk about the um, uh, the, right. uh, the the fourteen million um, uh, the marriages <laughs> registered. And every also, year. Uh, giving uh, senior citizens a choice to choose how they want to spend their right. um, life in the old it, age. Professor Go, I'm so much sorry to. Oh, okay. I, I'm so sorry to interrupt <laughs> you. We're running out of time on this broadcast. Okay. Thank you so much sure, for welcome. your patience and for staying with us here. And thank you for staying with us on this broadcast of the world today. I'm Zhongshi. Global Business is up next.